And I have Christine from Time Live. Great. So we are now welcoming you. It's official. It's the second edition of our uh, interdependent series. Very, very happy to be here, uh, especially because uh, we are now in a situation where I feel so blessed. What is happening is that I have two great people. Imagine how many times you search the web. I do this every day. And the founder of the person that appears on my screen every day, Christian Kroll, is one of the two invited guests about interdependence. Christian, a brief introduction about yourself. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is uh, Christian. As you said, I'm the founder of Ecosia, and uh, that's the search engine that plants trees. And I'm happy you're using it. Fantastic. And, and the second treat I have, I met Lorna back in 2015 when she gave an inspiring talk. And now she happened to give a number of other talks, but one of them has received almost 2 million views. So that's her TED talk about leadership, collaborative leadership. So Lorna, a brief introduction about yourself. Hey, well, Christian set the standard for brief, so let me go. Um, so I've spent, <laughs> I've spent my whole life in, in corporate, and most recently with Dana and the French food company, I think. Uh, probably everybody on this call knows that. For those Americans, uh, it's called Danon here. Um, and um, now I'm a global ambassador for B Corp and I'm on uh, some boards and I'm totally passionate about rhino conservation. Fantastic. So my role here will be to moderate uh, this, uh, this conversation. It's not a panel, it's not an interview, it's a conversation about interdependence. Just a little uh, confession between the three of us and the other hundreds listening. I hate definitions. So we're going to skip definitions about what does it mean and so forth. And we're going to go into the live stuff of what it's really all about. Uh, so I came across B-Lab. I was invited into B-Lab at the beginning, 2014, when B-Lab Europe was set up. And the first event had so much energy. And I said, where does this, all this energy come from? How do they create uh, this powerful momentum that really moves forward? And then when I got to know more about the whole organization and working with it, uh, this letter of interdependence came as very much at the center of uh, the whole organization. Uh, so this is basically every single uh, company that has a privilege of becoming a B Corp has to sign uh, this declaration of interdependence. And you can see the first line is, we envision a global economy that uses business as a force for good. Now that sounds wonderful. Now Lorna, why on earth is it so difficult to do something that seems so wonderful? Why can't all business just and simply be a force for good? What do you think? Well, I don't think it's as difficult as it seems in many ways because it's the natural way of humans. And um, I think that one of the things that we've done in business is sort of to weirdly carve up the world into little buckets um, and give them scorecards um, that make them appear to be separate from other things. And business has a scorecard that's financial only. That's a globally agreed standard that says the only thing that matters is money. And so there are businesses all over the world who are playing the game according to the existing rules, and that's the scorecard. Um, so I think that the reason that it's difficult for companies is because they need to shift the way that they consider success. Uh, they need to shift the way they measure things. And they need to, at this moment, they need to juggle multiple things. So uh, they need to work out how to deliver financial uh, results to effectively an old paradigm and then they have to create a new set of metrics a new set of values that they think is important upon which they measure themselves and christians i'm sure are going to talk a lot about that and have to to juggle that so it's a pretty tricky juggling act right now i mean i think that uh one of the things that's so powerful about the whole b corp movement is that it provides an alternative metric system or a holistic metric system um, that enables you to see what real success is, that includes humans and the planet and money. Um, so I think that's, that's why B Corp is such a beautiful sort of solution to what is currently a sort of a, um, a, a paradigmatic problem, if you like, where the world sees, uh, the financial world sees reality one way and all of us humans <laughs> see reality another way. So that's the best that I can, can answer your question. But of course, we could talk for many hours about this subject. 
is both interesting and worrying that we have uh, the economic system on one side and the human beings on the other, and they seem to be on two parallel tracks. And that's where I love that these two things come together. And what about Ecosia? Is it difficult for you for Ecosia to be a force for good or more broadly? Um, how, how are you a force for good? <laughs> I mean, for us, uh, really the main KPI, the, the good thing is that we don't have shareholders who are forcing us to maximize for profits. Uh, what we are doing is really to maximize for trees. So our main KPI at, at the end of the year, if you're looking at our at our success, then basically is the question, how many trees have we planted? Um, and, and these and are images, course, by the way, that you see now that are taken from some of the actual planting that is taking place because you say you're doing a search and you plant, here are the, what is being planted. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so how Ecosia basically works is that uh, we're a search engine like like Google or like Bing, um, and all the profits that we're generating is uh, going into tree planting projects around the world. Um, and we're planting in more than a dozen different countries now. Uh, we're soon reaching our 100 millionth tree. So, uh, and as I said, this is our KPI. <laughs> this is what makes us happy and was what uh, inspires us. Um, and yeah, I mean, of us, for us, of course, the general objective of, a comp of the company, I think, is to really um, not only do no harm, but really to, to do good. And uh, we want to maximize that with the efficiency of a normal, of a normal startup. Um, but also since, I mean, interdependence is the topic of the day, um, we wouldn't be able to do that without our partners. So we are not planting the trees ourselves, but we have local organizations who are doing that. Um, we, are, uh, we couldn't plant any trees if we wouldn't have any users who would use our website and thereby generate the revenue that we need. And also much of the technology that we're using is based on, on other platforms, like our search results to a large extent are powered by Microsoft. We're building things on top, but we couldn't do it without. Uh, so it's really also the way I see Ecosia is more like a network um, of, of partnerships. Uh, and there are other search engines that are, especially the, the monopolies that are a bit more focused on, on owning everything. Um, and I hope that uh, our way will eventually um, yeah, succeed. And it's usually because interdependence means things are connected, but you're actually adding a layer of giving value to that connectedness. So by partnering, it's not just I'm taking you take, but really something builds something more than each one of you could be building. And the happiness that you mentioned, there was one of the photos that we picked was the, I think the photographer and one of the planters there is just smiling widely. And I do perceive that energy, no? that happiness that maybe is missing in other organizations that do not feel that purpose uh, that drive forward. Uh, do you yeah. feel there's a happiness factor there that is uh, coming up that brings yeah, I, also results? I mean, is it just people laughing uh, or does it also bring some results with this? Yeah, um, I think that is, I mean, what Lorna said, I think this is just natural human behavior. We want to be, we want to do good. We want to be part of a community and contribute in a positive way. And I honestly, I have never worked at, a, at another company, so I, I don't know how, it's, how it is different uh, at, at other organizations. But for me, I mean, of course, there, there are challenges. I don't want to um, uh, idealize, of course, there, there are struggles that we will have to deal with, but the, just the basic satisfaction that you have for contributing to something that is bigger than yourself, I think that is really um, at least something that, that I could not live without if I had to look for a new job. Uh, that's really important to me. And Laura, you're nodding there when he was mentioning this happiness factor, this uh, feel-good factor. How have you seen that actually uh, being implemented or not implemented? And what consequences do you see when that was spread in your corporate uh, role and positions? Well, before I say anything more, Daniel, I want to tell everybody on this call, please use Ecosia because I moved to Ecosia since I met Christian. And not only does it mean that every time you search, you plant a tree, um, which is cool and it's lovely to kind of feel that. But actually there's this other benefit because, um, you know, I live in the US and so Google has me down, man. So I'll search for something and it delivers me stuff that it thinks that I wanted because of something else I searched for. And Ecosia doesn't know me so well. I like that because it, there's a freshness to my searching. And I noticed that, uh, so I've been comparing this week and I noticed that, um, you know, Google kind of sends me down old parts and Ecosia opens up some new and interesting parts from searching. And that's fantastic because I think we're all kind of getting down narrow paths. So please download the app. It's very easy. 
download the app every time you search you know just click on that app you have to kind of move it to your home screen because it can't be a default right now but do that okay now that's enough thank you, you very know, much that's enough hunting for you christian let's talk about happiness um you know i think you, one of the things i as you, as, you, as you speak about it, it makes me sad daniel because you know I've worked in big corporates for my whole life and I've spent a lot of time with corporates. That's what I do. And what I've noticed is that people have just become immune or numb to, um, to their working environments. And so I often, you know, in the old days when I actually went into offices, remember those days we used to go into places. Now I'm on zoom with people. Um, there's a kind of a heaviness that's very common in big corporate life. And so I think uh, the sort of refinding of our humanness is such an important part of this game because the reality is that, is, that, is that businesses are not designed to bring out the best in the humans. And sometimes we're happy and sometimes we're sad. I mean, that's what it is to be, to be us humans. And um, I think there are uh, one of the things I've noticed on this sort of world of COVID is at the beginning, people try to keep their little world super separate, right? So, you know, the dogs and the kids and everything were sort of separate. And then as the weeks have gone on, the dogs and the kids and the cats have started to come into the screen. And it's been fabulous. People have said, oh, it's so great to see people's homes because we're seeing their humanity. And so I think one of the things that I have found really powerful about B Corp is if you just take Ecosia as an example, immediately the business proposition of that of that organization connects the humans with the planet and with the people on the planet um, and so when i'm kind of advising corporates the first thing that i talk about is how do you reconnect people to the origin of your business and in a business manufacturing i've been in my whole life as i say in my ted talk i think about it as a river and upstream from us are people who produce stuff, you know, in, in the case of dinner and milk and, and plastic and, and, and water. Um, and, and there are humans who do that. <laughs> and then downstream from that, there are humans who sell and consume and, you know, use our product. Just starting there changes everything because then your, your humanity connects with their humanity and your whole business shifts focus. So I, I, I don't think it's as hard as it looks. And it's also important to be cautious or to be aware, not cautious, aware of the sort of general numbness that we've got used to. And I also feel that strange enough, this kind of Zoom or whatever we're using, these little windows, uh, I think the, the CEO used to be I think it's a 10th floor or the 12th floor, you know, that really special place where the, the special scent happens and everything is just nicer and everybody talks quietly. But now the CEO, the woman CEO, the man CEO, is just one of the other windows. So all of that hierarchy is also this interconnection and this interdependence actually becomes stronger because you're just another window. So now you have to prove your real worth in what you say in the example you lead is no longer the aura around you. It's just, you're one little window make that window work and make who you really are work. So definitely goes into that direction. Now being good, great, we've ticked it. What about being an activist? Uh, I've seen, I just checked your uh, LinkedIn uh, profile, uh, Christian, and I read the, quite an activist uh, kind of frame of mind. Uh, would you describe yourself an activist? Is it useful for a company to be activist right now? We've seen a lot of communication and quite strong messages being sent out. Maybe it's just marketing. What about the soul of an activist? Is it the important role to have today? Yeah. Um, so I would say, I mean, for a long time, I would say I wasn't really an activist. I didn't really participate much into demonstrations. But the more I learn about climate change, <laughs> the more passionate I, I, I have become. So I think for the last 10 years, I'm getting uh, much more engaged also uh, the people who are working at, at Ecosia are just uh, are people who, who care very deeply about um, not only climate change, but also a lot of, a lot of other uh, social and environmental topics. Um, and I, I mean, especially with climate change, I feel like we have so little time left. If we, if we are lazy or not just not quick enough, then we really risk uh, dramatic um, failure. And, and that's why yeah, I've, I've taken the position of becoming more active and actually also 
we as Ecosia have become more active and have um, yeah, started initiatives that really uh, sometimes even put uh, bigger companies on the spotlights because they've done things that are not okay or just showed um, that we can do things differently. Um, and that might not always be that you have to block the streets. I mean, we have employees who've been doing that and we're supporting uh, non-violent uh, climate activism. Um, but uh, also I think just leading by example is, is a type of act activism that I, that I really like a lot. And um, one thing that we're doing, I mean, of course we're using most of our money to plant trees and yes, we're also privacy friendly, but there are also more subtle things that we're doing within the company that, um, inspired a lot of organizations. And we have, for example, uh, we had the goal of powering 100% of our service with renewable energy. And we achieved that, I think, two years ago. And then we thought, why only 100%? Who says that 100% is, is good enough? Uh, why not do 200%? And um, like that kind of thinking uh, got a lot of other organizations who basically said, now we're fine. We, we've reached 100%. Now we can kind of basically raise the bar. and. Um, I think that that is that is the kind of activism, the kind of positive activism that I would like to, um, yeah, that I would like to be an example for. And uh, you probably know that Microsoft has recently updated their sustainability statement, and they've um, at least their ambition is to really not only become a company that doesn't have that neutralizes all its CO2 emissions, but also then a few years later remove all the CO2 emissions that they had put into the atmosphere um, in, in their entire history. And that is where Microsoft partner and we have we have for a long time told them, hey, um, why don't you get a bit more ambitious when, ambitious when it comes to sustainability? Carbon neutral isn't enough. And I think that was actually one of their headlines. Carbon neutral isn't enough. And that kind of inspiration and activism, I mean, probably Microsoft also like kind of came up with those ideas themselves, but maybe it helped a bit that we've been nudging as well and that's yeah i think we i hope we can be a, a role model um for especially bigger corporations because they are the leverage is just really really big and, and i love this 200 percent no imagine the 200 percent attitude when you go to work which is now just you know going from your kitchen to your uh, living room or something but as you go to work you, you're aiming for 200 percent that's really, you know, whoa, that wakens up your, your neurons and say, oh, maybe I can do something more. That really excites, just hearing that excites me. So I can imagine what yeah. the atmosphere is created there. Before Lorna uh, gives us her idea on activism and, and her role in, in the corporations, um, we have a Mentimeter, just to make sure that you guys are really part of the conversation. I think we've got an amazing team uh, that's uh, working behind the scenes, but very, very present. And so thank you, Yelitz. And thank you, Naila, for making all of this happen. And uh, this is the question that you can see on Mentimeter. So all you can do now, unfortunately, Mentimeter, I don't think is yet a B Corp. We have to work on that. But menti.com and use the code 914110. And we would start to think about your own organization and how it contributes to society, whether an activist or not. And do not forget to add your country and your industry. Okay, hashtag country, hashtag industry. So in my case, it would be hashtag uh, Madrid or hashtag Spain and hashtag my industry is I think saving the world with friends is probably my industry. So if you can just start to think as we listen to Lorna's uh, reply and then together we will see the answers that you're posting there. So menti.com using the code 914110. And I think uh, Yelitz might be writing this also on the uh, YouTube chat. So Lorna, what do you think about activism and the role of corporations or even within corporations, there's departments that are more activist than others, I guess. So it's not just, we think of corporation as this inhuman thing that comes together, but actually there's a number of human beings with very different behaviors. And even within that, there's departments, areas, sectors. So tell me more about activism and, and your experience with activism. Um. So I think that this is the biggest, was one of the biggest challenges um, at Danone. Um, and I think it's one of the biggest challenges for corporations. I think there's an old fashioned notion that says, um, uh, we're just meeting consumers needs and we don't have responsibility for any of these big things. Um, am I allowed to swear on this tube? 
<laughs> well, that's... let's see if they close us down or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do whatever we, we think we should be doing. What we well, want. Because fr frankly, this is bullshit, right? I think that the creation of a point of view in an organization um, is really an important skill to learn for the people in it. And it's an important um, a characteristic of an organization. And when you have a point of view about something, there are going to be people who are going to disagree with you. Surprise, surprise. But actually, you have a responsibility to have a point of view. And the more powerful you are, the more responsible you are to have a point of view. Um, and I think that what I what I noticed in Danone early on is um, a kind of a journey around this. First of all, sort of start, you know, the, the whole process of moving from, uh, you know, this kind of weird, careful space of we're just meeting people's needs to, um, okay, we do have a point of view, which very quickly went into a place of not knowing the answers. So if you take, for example, uh, carbon neutrality, I remember uh, at COP21 in uh, COP21, which was 2015, I think, uh, Emmanuel Faber uh, made an announcement that Danone was going to be full scope carbon neutral by 2050. And I remember the conversation that happened inside the company at that time, because the notion of full scope, which means all of the cows up there and all the humans and everything, and then all of the plastic and everything down here. People inside the company went, are you crazy? I mean, these people are not in our control. And we don't know how to do that. And so I remember the big debate was, well, what? let's put the time far away so that we don't scare everybody to death. But, but let's put that on the table. And what was interesting is as that notion was broadened, now, I mean, that was 2015. That seemed like a radical idea. Now the idea of not having a full scope carbon neutral um, policy is, is, is irresponsible and frankly crazy. So I think what's interesting around activism is that for a big corporate, it's, it's a journey around, around being willing to deal with conflict and people who disagree with you. And it's also a journey around speaking about stuff that you don't know the solutions to. And corporations are designed to hide and they're designed to know. <laughs> And so there's kind of a big cultural thing that people have to shift in. What's interesting is, of course, humans don't hide and they don't know. And so kind of reminding people that this is how it is, this is sort of a strange ease once people get comfortable with that. Because like, okay, cool, this is how it is. I mean, you know, every time we talk about this stuff, I talk about, you know, parenting. And I always say to people, you know, when you have kids, you're juggling short term, long term, you're juggling multiple KPIs or key performance indicators, because that's what we do. And then suddenly we come in a company and we go, hold on a second, it's only short term. Or hold on a second, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, three KPIs. So I think it's just a kind of a return to, to the natural way of us being. And I, I also want to say something about the role of different people in activism. So Christian can say stuff that a CEO of a company can't say. And he can actually uh, either inadvertently or advertently become a huge friend because he can provoke stuff that hopefully will lead to legislation changes. And if you consider the industries where serious activism has led to uh, legislation changes, which has helped the whole industry. But he can also provoke a conversation amongst consumers, competitors, customers, all sorts of people who will put pressure on the industry and help the sort of playing field to be le leveled. He can do that in a way that um, an individual in a big competitive organized, a big competitive industry can't do. So what I think is important for the people listening on this call is deciding where you belong in this conversation, deciding how strident to be um, and how to juggle and take, you know, pick your place. The option to be an activist or not option to not be an activist, that's not an option. You, you have to be an activist, period. The question of where you speak and how you speak, it all depends on how much power you've got, where you are, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of my take on activism. Beautifully said. And, and I think is this consciousness, this general culture, but also where do, where do I fit in the culture? Because sometimes we're, uh, we're just, oh, this is the culture, this is the way things are but they did not to be the same forever. 
we can actually have an effect on it. And I think what I find that works best is not one going out and, you know, I'll do it, I'll save it because then you get hit by everybody, but actually forming a group of people and together you have conversations, you go forward and you start to create and you're successful. And then people say, oh, I like what they do. I like the smile on the face. I like their attitude. What do they do that we don't do? And that's how you create this, what you said, activism by example, but it's not because things are, they will be forever like so. You have a role to play, not in your own with other people. By the way, they are coming in, the answers on menti.com. So just have a quick peek at what we received so far and you can continue. So again, menti.com at 9141.10. What does your organization do to contribute to society? We are seeing healthy, sustainable way of living, organic, delicious food. Oh, it's the right time to do that. Skill-based sponsorship, uh, making people aware of SDGs, help create and live purpose-driven companies. So it's interesting, it's fascinating to see the diversity of ways in which a company can contribute to society, does contribute to society. So just allowing this to to arise, I think is a very interesting point. And just keep uh, sending your points. We'll come back to them and just uh, share them with the crowd later. Menti.com, 91-4110. So what what I'm seeing a lot of is is, uh, a few years ago, I had to kind of push people about this why uh, the why, the purpose, it's really important to have purpose. Now, much less so. Now the question is more on the how. I would like to, but I'm totally lost. How on earth do I move forward? And I see Christian smiling, which would basically just do it. I guess it's the, the, the quick answer. But I think it's really also thinking of how can we build new mindsets and new kinds of actions? Uh, because I think, first of all, we have this mindset of, you know, this 200% mindset, this new way of thinking, and then new kinds of action. But sometimes I fear that we're waiting for uh, Greta Thunberg to, to come up, or for Christian to come up, or for Lorna to come up, for these heroes to come up. Uh, so at the recent EBBF uh, annual conference, we talked about rethinking success, which was a good topic. And we really came out saying what we need is universal participation. So it's not one or two heroes, but really create this mindset for action in everyone that's around you. Uh, Lorna, your your almost two million viewed uh, TED talk about uh, collaborative leadership. Is that what you have in mind to create this universal participation? Or do you think of just a few heroes, you know, the the Malcolm X, the Malcolm, well, Martin Luther Kings are necessary? Or how do you stimulate this universal participation for good? Because to me, the systemic systemic change we need does not come from a few heroes, but from this real uh, sense of me too, a positive me too, where I want to be part of this. What has been your experience in creating universal participation? What allows it and what uh, uh, doesn't allow it? It's an interesting question and I've kind of been surprised at how many people have watched my TED talk and I've noticed how you know somebody will find it and then circulate it to their friends and then it'll get a kind of another little you know bump and then people will reach out to me and say can we talk about it and so I learn about why they why they're why they're watching it or why they're interested in it and what what I'm noticing is that um, I think we We've, we're under an illusion early on in our lives or in, in society as, as a whole. You know, the hero idea is idealized in many places, movies, books, everything, that there's some single person who's going to um, save the day. Um, what's, what's, what people discover, um, some younger, some older, depending on their experience, is that the really important things are not possible to do alone. Like the really important things of life, even the small things of life um, are not possible to do alone. And so that, 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 that interdependence is inevitable. And so actually the struggle comes from trying to pretend that it isn't. <laughs> I mean, independence is important. Of course, we all have to learn to tie our shoelaces and, you know, look after ourselves. But, but we're more subtle and more nuanced and more complex than that. Very quickly, we get into needing each other. And so what I think happens is that people kind of instinctively realize that to do big and important and, and loving and, and um, moving things 
moving, touching, emotional things, they need to, they need each other. And um, that's a bunch of skills that are not sort of naturally taught. And in fact, they're kind of squashed out of us <laughs> in a way. And so there's something about sort of coming home, I think, to the idea of interdependence. And one of the things that's been interesting to me is people asking me the, the detailed how-tos. And one of the reasons I speak so much about meetings is because businesses and everybody on this call um, is kind of nodding because meetings is what happens when humans get together to do things. And all of us have been in meetings where you just think to yourself, this can't be happening. This is just a nightmare. This is the wrong people in the meeting. The subject's not clear. Nobody's having the right conversation. And all of us have been in meetings which we go, wow, this is so cool. I want to be in this. How do I, you know? And so thinking a, a lot in, in real detail about how you meet, who's in the room, what you're discussing, and then ensuring the most diverse um, audience or the most diverse participation, it's not audience, it's participation, uh, is really important. And you have to work on it and learn and experiment and get it wrong and try some more. Because but, but, but once you get the interconnection of the humans together well, um, things start to flow really differently. So I think, I, I think that people are really, um, they're, once they get comfortable with the idea that you can't get it right at the beginning, um, that you just need to keep on trying and experimenting, um, it's fun. It's fun getting other people involved. And there are times you want to kill each other and there are times you think the other person's an idiot, but that's well, welcome to life, you know? Uh, and there are times you have to get over yourself because we're all idiots sometimes, you know? So I think, uh, I think that the journey to interdependence is in a way the journey home to what feels right and then some new skills that need to be learned. And I, I think, uh, Daniel, you made a fantastic point at the beginning of this of this call about how these little boxes are a fantastic tool because not only is everybody equal, but you have fantastic tools like the raise hand, raise um, digital hand tools so that a quiet person can raise their digital hand, know that they've been seen by the facilitator, and then by the way, go back to the conversation rather than going, <laughs> pick me, which is kind of what happens in, in, in meetings when you don't have that, that function. So I think there are lots of things about the sort of Zoom world that hopefully will improve interdependence. And again, I, just one call on, uh, for, for people who are listening on this call or one request is um, use your power to challenge the way these things are working. Um, don't buy the I'm only 30 years old and I'm not the boss of this place and therefore I can't say what I think. This is your chance to say, you know, we had this Zoom call and it didn't really work for me. Can we talk about how that could work differently and so on? And, and by the way, I see a lot of people use my TED talk as a provocation for that. They say, well, you know, I showed the TED talk to my boss to show her that, that you know. So, you know, this is your chance. And particularly as we go back to work in our various forms, don't let's miss the opportunity to transform the way that we work together. And I have one, one last question to, to uh, both of you. I've got the privilege of having you. I can ask you the things I want to know. Uh, but do start to write your questions on the chat on YouTube. And already we saw a comment from Andian, Adian Brower. Sorry for pronunciation. And this uh, concept of awakeness, no? which I think is really important because uh, too often we're not aware, we're not awake, we're not conscious to what is happening. And I think that awakeness, that alertness, uh, again, to what somebody else is thinking and saying and why are they saying what they're saying of my role within society. So I think that's a really good point about how, how do you keep your people awake at Ecosia and aware of what's going on within the organization and outside? Yeah. Uh, awareness, mindfulness is, is a term that I, uh, that I really, uh, um, that I really like and also I, I do almost daily meditation practices to to train that basically um so yeah i think i mean in, in the end what what really determines um the outcome and also the the, uh, the awareness of, of a company is the culture that you have and what we're trying to create is uh, you said mindsets kind of 
mindsets where people are feel empowered to ask questions if they think if they disagree with things like one of the main questions that i uh, ask me if there if there are conflicts between certain priorities um like what would be the right thing to do and um those are questions that also our employees can bring up i mean we're only a team of 65 people so that's easier people if people see something that where we're where we're probably not doing the right thing then they can just come to me and tell me christian here i think um this is not good um and what i try to to um to facilitate is is a culture where, where basically everybody can speak up of course you can't be perfect on on everything we also need to have a startup mindset where you just need to get going. You need to do a first step somehow, and that first step won't be perfect. So people need to understand that as well, because trying to be perfect on everything can can basically keep you from doing doing that first step. Um, what what I think really helps at at our company, at least, is that uh, we have an ownership structure where we call ourselves a self owned company or purpose company, um, and basically that means that we've given up the or we've we've given most of the shares of the company away to the purpose foundation which makes sure that we never can sell the company we also can't take any profits out of the company and we can't change the purpose of the company the mission and that makes people much more because usually you have one owner or shareholders and they are in it for the money and um well <laughs> that's how the business runs um but in our case i think people really feel much more identified with the mission, with the purpose. And that also means that they speak up if we do something that shouldn't be in line with the mission. And um, yeah, just facilitating a culture where uh, good discussions can happen. I think that's then my role as the CEO of the company and trying to make the good, uh, good decisions um, so that we can also, I mean, achieve our mission of planting a lot of trees because we want to be very, very good on a lot of topics. But then the question is, how do we now get started? And that is the that is the difficult discussion. Where probably also most people don't necessarily agree a hundred percent, but you need trust from your team that at least you try to make the right decision and you at least you listen try to listen to everyone. So yeah, that's that's my approach. And I think it's also you're all you both rethink in structures and and the way things are and who is a leader who is not. And ADBBF, so uh, it's a Baha'i inspired organization and service is one of the core values. So I am the director general. So you could say, oh, I've reached the top, but actually I've reached the bottom of the, of the organization because now I'm serving everybody. So it's just reversing the whole concept of the, the CEO, the director general actually being at the very bottom of service to everybody else. And that creates a, a situation where everybody else says, oh, how can I serve? How can I be of service? And so definitely it's, it's interesting to reverse the known structures to something that really works much better and goes forward. Yeah. So my last question before we go into the Q and A is uh, a very timely one. So we are facing at last, uh, well, it's a terrible thing that to have uh, to have in the news in in the first place, but it's very much in the news, which is this racial injustice. Uh, so it's it's been happening for a long, long time. Uh, now, hopefully, we have an opportunity or the, the, the opportunity, yes, to do something really strong about it together. So what is the role of companies there? Uh, Lorna, of course, you've been living through apartheid uh, in, in South Africa. So you know exactly what that implies and how, how that has worked. You've also tried, you've, I've, I've seen you've worked in five continents, uh, uh, lots of countries. So you've got this wider sense uh, of the world. Has that informed your role, companies' roles to fight racism, to bring about a new, much needed mentality? Yeah, this is a, this is a subject that uh, troubles me a lot because you know I'm a, I'm a white South African and frankly, I did almost nothing in apartheid um, because I was too self-involved um, and I didn't see who I was and I didn't see the privilege that I had um, I used to march against the rugby tours, but I only marched because I was at university and it was an opportunity to smoke cigarettes and drink beer. You know, I didn't uh, really think about it. But um, so now uh, I live in the US and um, the question that I have been asking myself is, so who am I in this? Um, and, and who I am is, uh, this is my chance really to make a difference. And I think that... Um, the, the responsibility for all of us is to educate ourselves on the specific form of racism that's occurring in the world in which you live. And I do think having lived in a few countries, 
every country is racist, just racist differently, depending on its history, depending on, you know, the structure of the country. And so I think it's important you understand your particular flavor of racism and you decide how you're going to um, participate in that. Um, and, I, you know, education is one of them. And I think, you know, all of us uh, who have privilege need to understand how we're privileged and we need to learn from people who don't have privilege and we need to have big ears and we need to be willing to be wrong. We need to be willing to be called out on our misunderstandings and we need to be educated. And just as I spoke earlier about our need to not know and our need to be open, our need to be willing and our willingness to change the way we think about things, this is a time. But I think that um, I think that the the we also need to be activists in any way we can, and you know, marching in the case of the U.S. is one of those things. Driving for uh, for changes in legislation is another way because I'm really worried that we're just going to have lots of marches and then not enough changes to legislation. So I think that that's a really important thing. But at a corporate level, there is nothing that beats having the right representation in the room and including them in the conversation. And that means changing the shape of the conversation often. So, you know, I've been in too many rooms in my life where you've had the right representation, but the entire shape of the conversation was designed around not only, you know, white privilege, but also extroversion, also, you know, gender preferences and so on. So thinking carefully about how you can best get them, how you can get the best out of all of the people in the room once you've got them in the room is also really important. And there's a really simple way to start there, which is ask, like, how is it for you? You know, I spent six years in China and I learned a lot about Chinese women in particular who were really, really difficult to get to participate in a broad meeting because they were shy and they were taught not to speak out. And so, but over time with experimentation and careful listening, we found ways to include their conversation, them in the conversations. So I think it's really important that you, first of all, acknowledge you don't know uh, what, what you don't know. Make sure you're having the right conversations with, um, with people who don't have privilege and then experiment your way in. And don't be, I was coaching somebody the other day who said, oh, I'm terrified, I'm walking on eggshells and I don't really know what to say. You know, don't be so self-conscious, man. This isn't all about you. Try, talk, make a mistake, but move into this conversation. Don't hide under your desk because this is, this, is, this is hard stuff. And if you think it's tough for you as a white person with privilege, let's start thinking about the people who have not had privilege for such a long time. And so once we kind of get over ourselves, <laughs> Uh, and we all have to all the time because it's, you know, weird, this being, this being human business. Um, there's all sorts of new learning available to you. And this is our chance to do this thing because I do think that COVID has allowed people to settle their thinking a little. Uh, some people, people with privilege, people who haven't got privilege haven't had time to settle their thinking, but people with privilege have. So let's, let's use this moment to, to change things forever. It's interesting. So there's a lot of letting go, to ref a lot of refreshing, a lot of new thinking. Uh, you mentioned also laws. I was quite taken by the um, um, uh, the B Corp uh, Ben and Jerry's and the campaign they did with the new ice cream. So they use something which is delicious, like ice cream. I die for it. And they got the, the pecan uh, uh, thing, and they had a big announcement that we're launching this. It's pecan. We can. Let's do something about it. And it was not just, oh, let's uh, protest in general. It was specifically asking for five laws to be changed. So it's a corporation that uses its product to send a message and to uh, drive forward specific requests, law requests to be changed. So that's really taken it to a way forward. And Christian, I know that you're doing stuff as well at Ecosia around this uh, whole concept of fighting racism. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, you can't solve climate change without also addressing not only racial injustice, but but all kind of social injustice. I think those topics just belong together. Um, so it, even if I, uh, yeah, if if I would just go for the climate change solution, uh, you can't exclude those topics. And in our tree planting projects, um, I've met so many amazing people from different backgrounds where I realized. If you had been in my position, you would be way ahead of me now because I just had all those privileges and you didn't have them. But still, you managed to to really do 
really amazing work. So I'm like most of my role models are really people that that I that I think are um, yeah doing doing more amazing work than or more better work than I do are people in our tree planting projects or people who were coming from very very different backgrounds and. Um, yeah, that for me, so for me, I feel an obligation to contribute to an improvement of the situation that we have now because we're not in a, we're still very far from a, from a um, really a society that works for all of us. And, um, but I'm also aware that I'm, I'm uh, I mean, Berlin startup community is dominated by 35 year old male and look who you're talking to. <laughs> so uh, I'm very aware that I'm benefiting from a lot of those privileges. And I think, I'm aware, I think awareness is a big, big thing. Uh, like I'm aware of certain biases. I try to work against them. I also try to make sure that we as a company um, really work on, on inclusion and, and equal treatment of, of, of everyone. So um, we're far from perfect there, but I think just this acknowledging and awareness is, is, a, um, is a good start. And um, then we also want to because it's not only about being aware of it, we of course also want to do, do stuff. So um, there's small contributions that we're making like uh, a donation to a Berlin uh, NGO that is helping people who are generally underrepresented in tech because we're a Berlin tech company and we're making donations to that organization, even though it's not about planting trees, but it's, it's just something that uh, if you look at the bigger picture, what we actually want to achieve and that is a world that works for everyone and also a sustainable world, with a functioning planet, um, then this I think just just makes uh, natural sense. So, yeah, for me, I mean, I think for any any CEO of any company or any leader, that should be an important topic. Um, and I'm like every other leader, I'm, I'm trying to do my best there. Um, but I think also Ecosia as a as an organization, we really see our responsibility to to make sure that the the world is more just for everyone. Thank you very much. And now it's time for question and answers. There's so many questions. I, I'm not sure if we're going to cope with all the answers, but I, the first two that I that I copy pasted from uh, YouTube. One is is uh, to both of you. What do you think about these collaborative projects that use new economic models to align incentives from Jerry Smiths? So it's not just about collaborative projects, but collaborative within a new new set of incentives so it's not the old incentives about uh, win-win <laughs> uh, you know profit profits but there's other incentives that create this kind of benefit so with your partners what other kind of incentives do you have to create this interdependent and this collaborative uh, ideas do you have some ideas or some examples of these I'm not sure I understand the question I'm really sorry um, so can, the can you help me? Word is, when you think about collaborative projects yes that use new economic models to align incentives. So there's the old economic model, which is yeah. what we're doing, yeah, sure. and other collaborative projects, which is new models, new systems, new reciprocities. Yes, sure. Oh, so you go, Christian. You probably got a better perspective on this than me. Thanks. Yeah, it was actually because I don't know the specific model that, that you mentioned or the specific approach, um, but I think the, I is, let me just assume and then hopefully that answer fits. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, of course, uh, the, what I think one of the main problems of our society is that we put just one, we optimize for just one factor and that is GDP for countries or that is um, profit for uh, companies. And I think that is that is harmful, and we need to find better approaches. And um, there, uh, who keeps you from taking into account a lot of different other factors? Like, um, I mean, I, I studied business administration, and I was surprised that uh, always, like all lectures, uh, were started with 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 the assumption that companies are um, uh, exist because they have to maximize the profit for the shareholders. At, at least in Germany, and that's nowhere. <laughs> that's not written anywhere, not in, in any legal frameworks. Companies can exist to maximize the happiness of their employees or uh, have uh, um, the highest possible impact on solving climate change, for example. And really just being aware that you're, uh, that you're embedded into a system and that you have to make a lot of stakeholders um, or respect them at least, maybe not optimize for that, but at least respect that you're, you're embedded into society. And um, that, that for us is, I mean, just uh, 
guiding decision framework as well. Like we, we try to, um, again, ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing? And if we at, at one of these points realize, oh, no, actually not, um, then, um, yeah, then we would have to change that. Not sure if that's really the answer to the question, Perfect. but that's at least our approach. And thank you very much. So we need to really rethink uh, some basic assumptions, KPIs, measures of how this work, who, who actually gains from this in a, in a broader sense, which makes total sense. And I think there's a lot of experiences within that, within the B Corp movement, but also outside the B Corp movement that it's working very well. There's a, there's a message for you specifically, Lorna, from Jerry Smith, uh, thinking more about leaderless, decentralized organizations that are vaguely related. I like this vaguely related. Uh, you know, you're used to uh, structures and who's here, who's there. What about this vagueness? Is vagueness something that creates uncertainty and therefore unease and people work less efficiently? Or maybe something welcome where people then step in because there's less of a, a top-down leadership and they need to step up to work to work forward. Yeah, this is a really interesting um, conversation. I'm still thinking about the previous question, but let me come to this question. So um, I think this is, a, this is um, the, the, the dilemma here always is how do you have enough structure for people to have some sort of sense of um, clarity around what needs to be done and who's doing what? but at the same time have enough fluidity for people to be able to operate um, on, on, the, on the move or, or, or more sort of, or flatter, more connect, you know, more interconnected, more vague if you like. And if you take uh, reinventing organizations, for example, uh, Frederick Laloux, I'm sure everybody on this call has read that book. I, what I, I notice in people in this space is, um, this is, this, is my, this is my sort of simple response to it. If you think there's structure that is kind of the old way of doing things um, with little boxes and little hierarchies, um, and then you have process, which is kind of rigid processes that, um, that, that, that kind of, you know, go together with structure or they can in fact uh, replace or, or, you know, compensate for some lacks of lack of structure. And if you take things like holacracy, in a way, you know, they kind of offset the, the lack of structure with like a hell of a lot of process. <laughs> and so it became in a way even more stifling. Um, the third element of that really is people and the way that people are interconnected and how com relationships happen. So if you take, again, I was using family in this conversation. Um, if you think about, I don't know, what you guys are gonna do in the holidays, um, there's a whole lot of conversation in your family about who does what and where the power is and is the decision with your mother or your, you know, your grand, you know, what, there are a lot of unspoken rules that order um, our human relationships. And those are, uh, some of those are expressed and some of them are not, but they're all kind of people related. Um, I think that we need to think consciously about the balance between structure, process and people to find the best mix. And it depends on what you're up to, it depends on how big you are, it depends how physically separate you are from each other as to the decision that you make. I, I know a lot of people who are experimenting in this space and, and mostly people are saying that when you kind of remove clarity or you reduce clarity, you, um, you reduce speed sometimes. So, you know, I've, I know people who've got like have replaced their sort of single person CEO structure with a group of seven or eight people um, to make decisions together. And they're like, well, this doesn't work. This is exhausting. We're going round and round in circles. We're not sure how to make decisions. So that's not working for us. So they kind of backed off from that. Um, I, I think that uh, all of it is possible as long as you experiment and as long as you consciously um, Think through how the how you know how how the system of your organization matches the purpose of your organization, <laughs> and and then and then it's a it's a dance, and none of us have figured it out, right? Including uh, including Frederick Leloup. If you have a look at that book, there's a lot of talk about an outcome. There's not a lot of talk about how to get from here to there, 
and Christian must be having this conversation in his business all the time. How does he handle it when it gets bigger? So I, uh, that's a hell of a lot of answer to the question. It's about experimentation between those three things, in my view. Christian, do you have a view? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I think this is really um, <laughs> complex and I'm still uh, trying to really understand my or develop my, my perspective on this because I think it's just um, really to understand how organizations work, you need to have worked in organizations for a while. And uh, yeah, it's not for such a long time that I'm doing this. Um, I, what I think what um, I really like the principle that people want, I mean, people want autonomy, they want to have a purpose and they want to have mastery to so get better at what they're doing. And those are the guiding principles. And we're a bit more fluid when, to, when it comes to how much structure we need, how much process we need for this, how much how clear does it have to be who exactly is the leader in a situation but i definitely see that if you have if it's undefined then then there's usually a lack of clarity and that makes you slow and um so we need to solve climate change quickly so we're also our like our um let's say our capacity for for um experimentation is also limited because we need to move uh, we need to move, move fast and we had Frederick Lalou, for example, he once even gave a, gave a talk at Ecos, and I really like a lot of principles that are behind that, uh, that are <clears throat> in the book, but also just behind of the idea of distributing authority to more people and autonomy definitely is something that I think we, we hold very dear at Ecosia and that, that we're also doing quite successfully. Um, it's just, um, I think uh, it really depends on the context and the, I usually get asked questions like, should you do this or that? The, the answer really is, I don't know, <laughs> because it really depends. Um, and that is maybe not the perfect answer, but I think if you, the more I learn, the more I realize that this is the answer that I would give. It's a never going learning. I think this awareness, learning, adapting, and there's no rules. That's a beautiful thing. There's no rules. It's going back to our human self, understanding, having empathy, understanding what is important, who is important, and re restarting those kind of conversations, most important. We have a, one last question on Mentimeter for you. Uh, let's see, Mentimeter is going to appear, and then Lauren and Christian are going to ask you for one last thing uh, to leave with, their, with the audience. So how can we leave them in a way that of, of uh, understanding and of action? What can get them going? What would you suggest? So the Mentimeter's question is one word, one word, just one word, you take back for a two-year workplace from today. So we talked about interdependence and so many facets of it, so many ideas, so many uncertainties. We would love to see one word that comes up in your mind as you go back to uh, your workplace. Menti.com, 9141.10. We'll leave the screen on, so we'll see these uh, one words appearing. Christian, what is one piece of advice you would share with the audience that is now keen to take this and create even better workplaces? Mm -hmm. um, I, of course, don't know the audience, but I think there is, I mean, there is a lot that still can be done better in our world. And really just looking at what we, what kind of products we buy, what kind of services we consume, or just what interactions we have, um, what can actually be done better in those areas um, from a sustainability perspective, but maybe also from like other social injustice perspectives. And I really hope that we, I, I like entrepreneurship, that we have more people who actually um, start moving because yes, we, we at Decosia, we had, we planted almost hundred million trees, but I think our systematic impact is much, much bigger than that. And I hope to see more uh, initiatives that uh, also try to change the world um, by just fixing small or big problems. So actively look for what is needed. Actively, I think is an excellent word. Lorna. Um, so I think I would say, think of yourself as being on a river and understand who's upstream from you and how you need to connect with those people to ensure that what arrives at your part of the river is um, what you need and want and then understand all of the people downstream from you so that you understand what you are passing down your part of the river to the people downstream. And as soon as you think of yourself like that, trust your own judgments. It's sort of obvious after that. A lot of trust is required. And I would say that uh, 
It's really looking around you, who is resonating with you, what ideas, what organizations, what movements resonate with you, and enjoy dancing with them, enjoy learning with them. Enjoy, to me, is a really important word. We are suffering under stress and so forth. We need to enjoy what we're doing. We have a place to live in life. Let's just live this life in a joyful and meaningful way. And there's lots of friends around B Corp and the B Corp movement that we can dance with. So I look forward to this dancing uh, continuing across continents. Thank you so much to both of you for inspiring this hour together and to all the listeners who I know are active uh, doers as well. And uh, let's uh, live into dependence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. So I think it's it's uh, we'll we'll.